listen to scripture as I read it to you from the Gospel of Luke. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I'm sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you, you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in your in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide. For the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is said before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into the streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. And whoever rejects you, rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. The seventy returned with joy. Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Never, nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The story that Emily read to you about Naaman, the Syrian general, is one of my favorite Old Testament stories because it is rich in irony, drama, and even has some dark humor in it. It is a story about health care delivery, a miracle, a healing miracle. But more importantly, as you will see, it is a story about the very nature of power and how the Bible understands power. And so what I propose to do today is first look at the story from the perspective of the miracle that takes place, a healing miracle. Second, I want to examine the power dynamics in the story because they're fascinating. And finally, I want to look at the way this story may speak to us today in the 21st century. But first, let's look at the miracle story. Naaman, a general in the army of the king of Aram, Aram was Syria, modern-day Syria, was ill. He had leprosy. You know, one of a number of different skin diseases that afflicted the ancients in the Middle East. Leprosy was unsightly, and because the origins of it were unknown, those who were afflicted with it were alienated and were removed from the mainstream of society. Lepers inspired dread in others. They did not want to be around them. Lepers were despised were marginalized. They were believed to be not only physically unclean, but also spiritually and morally unclean. After all, why were they afflicted with leprosy? They must have done something bad. Syria, because of its geographical relationship with Israel, was a natural foe. And at different times in its history, the Syrians raided and conquered Israel. I want you to 
lead us to realize that in 2,800 years since this story occurred, very little has occurred in the Middle East. Syria and Israel are still at it. These conquering raids brought the Syrians wealth, but also slaves. Naaman, the general, returning to Syria from one of his conquests, his raids in Israel, brought his wife, a young girl, a Hebrew girl, from one of his raids. Honey, look what I found at work today. Here, for you, a slave. She would serve as a maid, but in essence, she was a slave. She was absolutely powerless. She owed, owned nothing, not even her own life. But this is where the story begins to turn. Apparently, the healthcare system in Syria could not help Naaman. And so the young Hebrew slave girl, who was a prize of war, had compassion on her master, Naaman, and told him that, you know, there's a prophet in Israel in a place called Samaria who might be able to help you. Naaman wanted to see this prophet. And so he went to his king, after all he was a general, and he received a referral. <coughs> the king said, go then. I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. And so he, sent to Israel, so he went to Israel and soon found himself at the doorstep of the prophet Elijah. Naaman wanted to see the prophet, but the prophet wouldn't see him. Instead, what does he do? He sends a messenger to greet Naomi. Once again, I think we have a modern parallel with our healthcare system, no, do we not? Have you ever been on the phone trying to get through to the physician and get caught in you know, the voicemail system? I'm sure you have. The message is simple. Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and you'll be all better. Naaman was angry. He felt like he had been disrespected. He felt like he had received the modern equivalent of take two experts and call me in the morning. Finally, though, he was persuaded by his own servant. Look, Naaman, you come this far, can it hurt? Take a debt. Naaman did and was healed. Healed. The miracle story should intrigue us. Because healing in this story did not occur because of Naaman's faith. This was not a faith healing. All along the way, Naaman shows just the opposite of faith. He's skeptical. He had his doubts. He even at different times wanted to just pack it in. Healing did not occur because he had the right belief. He was not a Hebrew. He was an enemy of the Hebrew. He was a Syrian general, a commander of those who hated the Israelites. Instead, what we learn from this miracle story is about the grace of God, the love of God. The healing of God knows no borders nor nationalities. The Hebrew people who first read this story would have been extremely upset. A Syrian heal, a general no less. They would have been upset because God healed someone who was their natural enemy. Literally someone who brought great harm to their people. But the lesson was not lost. In short, God heals out of network. And God loves all of God's people. But if more importantly, I think this is a story of power. And we miss the power in the story often. It's a story of powerful men and powerless slaves. And so let's take them one by one. First the men. Naaman was a general, a military man. Someone who wielded great personal power and national power. He had many troops under his command. Literally, he had life and death in his hand. He must have been a very important military leader because his king was willing to help him out. 
And yet Naaman, for all his power, all his authority, was compromised by his illness. For all his power, he could not heal himself. The second figure is unnamed, Naaman's king. He, too, wielded a great deal of power. In the eyes of the world, he was a powerful individual. Kings in those days had the power of life and death, and were often regarded as gods in and of themselves. And yet, for all his power, he too could do a thing to help them. No one in his country could. The third figure was the king of Israel, also a person of power. He too acknowledged the life and death of the king of, of Syria, and he feared that if Naaman wasn't cured, Syria would attack. That's what he, why he was upset. He interpreted the letter from the king as a message of provocation. And he was so afraid, what did he do? He rents his clothes, tears them off as a symbol of his fear. If we don't help him, we're done. Here we have three of the most powerful individuals in two adjacent nations. Naaman the general was a leper. His king was dependent upon another king for Naaman's help. And the king of Israel was scared out of his wits. They all had the temporal power of the world. And yet they were paralyzed and were helpless. They had no control over the course of events. And their lives seemed to be in the hands of fate. They were, in short, powerful men who were powerless in this situation. But there are three other characters around in this story turn. These three individuals are true power brokers in the story, and they reveal a great deal about what the Bible sees as power. Elisha the prophet is first. He was in control right from the beginning. He was not motivated by fear, as the kings were, no. He did not react or overreact to the situation, no. He was aghast at the fear that his own king expressed. And finally he told him, just send him into me, everything's gonna be okay. Elisha was a prophet who was intimate with God and who spoke God's message to God's people. He was the vehicle of healing. And ultimately, his prescription worked. But there are two other characters who intrigue me. They were the two unnamed slaves or servants. In this story of healing and power, it was the powerless, anonymous slaves who had the most influence over the events. Consider, as I mentioned before, slaves do not own their own lives. They do not have their own day, their own time. But in this story, the powerful are absolutely dependent upon them. The story began with the words of the Hebrew slave girl. I think there's a prophet in Israel who can heal you. Her words did more to change the course of history than the actions of generals and kings. The way the story was written, she was the prime mover behind all the events. A powerless, unnamed Hebrew slave. Yet in the eyes of the Bible, in the eyes of God, she was the central figure of power in this narrative. What was her motivation? What? Why did she do this? All we can conclude is compassion. Hers was the power of love. The second was Naaman's servant. He was the one who calmed Naaman down when he was having his hissy fit. He said, look, go ahead and wash yourself. It won't hurt. Who knows? It may help. And it did. Naaman was angry by the prescription, ready to head home, ready to start some real trouble. And generals can. Instead, his servant, powerless, once again unnamed servant, 
prevailed upon him to bathe in the Jordan. And Naomi was healed. The story turned on the words and the direction of a person, a servant, by whom, by all earthly standards, was powerless. In the Gospels, Jesus proclaims to us that the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. In the Gospels, Jesus speaks in terms of paradoxes that seem strange to us, literally turning upside down our views of power, authority, and purpose. And yet, in this amazing story in the Old Testament, we see that the weak are the powerful, and the mighty are literally pulled down from their thrones and humbled. It is as if the words of Mary in the first chapter of Luke had come alive. What does this story say to us today? Although I've cast it in terms of power and health care, I believe it has a profound message for those of us in the 21st century, those of us here in this room. First, it speaks to the body politic. Power, whatever it is, is temporal. It does not last forever. It comes and it goes and thus should be wielded with humility. Second, history as we know it, as we study it, as we learn it and teach it, is the story of great events, powerful people, great speeches, and momentous battles, is it not? But in truth, what we learn here from the Bible is that history is a story of little events, single sentences, and seemingly inconsequential people who make all the difference. The Bible is, in the best sense of the word, a people's history. It's a story of God working through second sons, slaves, and outcasts who literally impact the arc of history itself. It's a story of Moses, Pharaoh, David versus Goliath, Esther versus Haman, Jesus versus the Roman Empire, Caesar. Third, I think there are times when we each and all feel that things are out of control. There are times when we feel our lives are inconsequential. We have nothing to contribute. There are times when we get really down upon ourselves and think that we are worthless in the eyes of others and in the eyes of God. We sometimes fall prey to that belief that my life doesn't make a difference. There's a movie made about that called It's a Wonderful World. The story of the Hebrew slave girl challenges that notion. The power of the world God has placed in the hands of the weak and the nameless. The story of Naaman is an amazing story of power. Not human power, but the power of God made perfect in the weakness and the compassion of human beings. Human beings like you and me. This is the good news of the gospel. Amen.